Welcome to The Real Deal with Jason Silverman, the podcast dedicated to helping you build the business of your dreams and live the life you always hoped for, with valuable and fun tips and info to make your life easier and more fun. And now, here's your host, a man who sprinkles metal shavings on his breakfast cereal just for fun, Jason Silverman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to The Real Deal with Jason Silverman. I'm your host, Jason Silverman, and I'm thrilled to share some time with you once again today. This is actually a really, really special show. I get the opportunity to meet with, interview, and pick the brains of super, super smart people. Well, um, today, that's actually no different, but it's actually one of my one of my nearest and dearest friends, and talk about a real deal superstar. It's uh, This is going to be just an unbelievable show, so hopefully you guys have a... Uh, your door is locked, you're ready to rock and roll, and um, your wrists are stretched out because you got a lot to write today. So, as you know, I am always, always on the hunt for interesting as well as super smart real deal guests. And, as I said, today is right, right on par. <clears throat> I want to introduce my listeners to somebody who has really been there and done that in so many ways. And, as always, I'm excited to pick his brain for your benefit. Now, for the folks who I work with in any of my coaching programs, my mastermind groups, or through Powerful Words Character Development, All-Star Cheer Sites, or Dance Sites Done Right, you know how much I focus on acting on lessons taught by people who have actual real-life experience, as opposed to just, you know, philosophy-type stuff, right? Well, the show is going to help us to do just that. So today, it's going to be my honor and privilege to share an amazing resource with you. You're going to love today's guest. He's got a ton of valuable information about real deal and real life success secrets that you were probably never taught unless you've been in the places he's been. And quite honestly, folks, very few of us have. So I am, I'm sure you already know, I'm committed to helping business owners just like you to become more successful, enjoy your career more, and in general, make your life significantly more fun. So it's that time, folks. I want you to stop surfing Facebook, put down your tablet, your phone, your dog, your cat, your spouse, your child, anything that could possibly distract you from today's show. You're not going to want to miss even a second of it as we move forward. So <clears throat> before we officially get going, I want to give you a little bit of background about our guest today. In 1992, Mike Lozier joined the Marine Corps. He went to Paris Island in South Carolina and graduated honor grad. He went in as an infantry marine, but was selected after numerous tests to be moved to the intelligence community. He graduated boot camp, went to marine combat training, then to intel school, and then shipped off to his first duty station. He shipped off in 1993 to Misawa Air Force Base, a remote Air Force Base in northern Japan. He spent two years there deploying his craft in a highly successful manner. Mike left Misawa at the end of 94 and reported to 2nd Marine Division Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. It was here that he volunteered to join the the reconnaissance community. This community, folks, is 100% volunteer. You run an in-dock, and then you have to be selected by the teams. Upon selection, he was sent to Fort Story, Virginia, to attend the Amphibious Reconnaissance School, where he graduated number one honor grad. You guys starting to catch a pattern here? Once part of his reconnaissance platoon, Mike attended the best of the best courses. U.S. Army Airborne School, Ranger Course, Seer School, U.S. Marine Corps Close Combat Instructor School, just to name a few. While stationed at Camp Lejeune, he was part of two Marine Expeditionary Units Special Operations Capable and multiple real-world operations. After five years in North Carolina, deployed out had run its toll, and in 1999, Mike reported to Fort Meade, Maryland, to work at the NSA, the National Security Agency. He did his tour there where he was then selected for the Marine Corps Enlisted Commissioning Education Program. This is a program that turns enlisted Marines into officers. He went back to Officer Candidate School and then to the Basic School, where he graduated at the top of his class and then switched gears and chose financial management. Nobody expected financial management, but... You know, a little inside baseball is part of his master plan with his wife Robin to set themselves up for future success in the civilian sector. As a financial management officer, Mike was responsible for funding all the Marine Corps detachments across the U.S. for training and education command. Then, in 2007, he left the Corps and began his second career. That was being a business partner with his wife and owner of their own Valpac franchise. In 2013, Mike and his wife Robin 
just purchased another franchise to grow their current one and continue to grow their product to this day. Folks, get ready for some fun. Mike, welcome to The Real Deal. I'm thrilled to have you today. Thanks for having me, Jason. Uh, you make me want to go back to the Marine Corps right now. <laughs> Please don't. Um, we, uh, we, we, we like having you here. Tell you what, you know, before we get started, for those who haven't had the opportunity and pleasure of meeting you, hearing you speak, uh, sharing multiple beers with you, um, take a second, share your story with our listeners. You know, what are you passionate about? What makes you tick? Who is Mike Lozier? Um, that's, that's a loaded and complicated question, Jason. And I guess it all depends on who you're asking. Uh, if it's someone that's drinking beers with me, they'll tell you that I, I'm a loyal, loyal friend. But um, I think the, the simple answer for who is Mike Lozier is that I am a severely intense and fiercely loyal individual. I'm driven by success, but I'm scared to death of failure, which I think is a good thing because fear heightens your senses and keeps you alert. And in my world, it gives me this unparalleled drive to some of those around me. I think uh, the Marine Corps and the situations that I've been in uh, has taught me how to utilize that fear to heighten my senses and, and make me more alert in everything that I'm doing. And in my military career, I never did anything that I wasn't the best in. Uh, it just came easy. You know, it's not, it's not that I'm bragging. It just really came easy to me. You know, from the moments I stepped in on those yellow footprints at Paris Island, I was probably one of the few people that instead of this craziness all around you with people screaming at you, I actually felt a calm for the first time in my life. And I knew I was where I needed to be. Um, and what, that helped me prepare myself for the private sector uh, to expect that same high level. Uh, so I expect that as a businessman, as a husband, as a father, and I, and I expect that from those around me as well. You know, your bio, it, it goes over so much, but I got to kind of, you know, unpeel that onion and, and so you can under, understand throughout this podcast who I am today and how I got there. There's, there's something very significant about what I can do. Like, I just can't do something if I'm not committed to it, right? So, you know, I, you graduate high school, you know, in the 90s, and back then, what, what's the next thing you do? You go to college, right? Everyone goes to college, you know? And I was following in the footsteps of my older sister, who was a straight-A student. She went to NYU in New York City. Uh, so it was a big shadow. And uh, I, went to, I went to college because that's what I was supposed to do. I didn't even know what I wanted to do. But my dad said, you know, hey, work with horses. That would be cool. I wanted to do that. So I went to college to work with horses because that would make my dad happy. Well, I wasn't committed to it. So the whole time I was there, I didn't apply myself 100%. Gulf War comes on, and the whole time I'm at school, I'm struggling with my decision because I know I don't necessarily want to work with horses for the rest of my life. Um, I had this guilt because my aunt had three of her sons uh, serving in the armed forces at that time. And I was like, how can I be sitting here at school not committed to something while my cousins are, are defending our country? So I think... Be it a combination of uh, guilt because I didn't know what I wanted to do, uh, guilt from, for, for my cousins, and the fact that I think my college actually asked me to leave their university, um, <laughs> that I decided to go to the recruiting office. <laughs> you know, I, I went and I talked to the Air Force, the Army, and the Navy, and all of them were promising me all these great things that they could provide me in my future. And I finally walked into the Marine Corps uh, recruiter's office. The guy's name was Staff Sergeant Wills. I'll never forget it. I walked in, you know, cocky Long Island uh, high school graduate college guy and says, you know, what, what's the Marine Corps going to do for me? And he looked me right in the eye and said, absolutely nothing. What can you give to the Marine Corps? And, you know, I don't know if that was his sales pitch or whatever, but I was blown away right there. I knew from that moment I wanted to be a Marine, right? So I wanted to be part of something that was bigger than myself, but something that needed a part of me to make it better. Um, and I was done hook, line, and sinker. The rest is history. Like you mentioned in the bio of me, you know, I joined in 1992 and I excelled in everything. It's just everything that I did as a Marine, I was great at. You know, fitness, knowledge, qualifications, rank, they all came fast. I was home. And fit, Marine Corps had 15 years of my life. Um, and it probably would have had another 15 or would have had me until the day I died. But at the 15-year mark, I fell in love with something else. And I realized quickly that the love that I had for this next thing, which was my wife, um, no longer enabled me to commit myself to the Marine Corps 100%. And in my line of, of work that I was doing in the Marine Corps, uh, you, you couldn't stay in the Marine Corps and, and not give 100%. 
So with Robin taking over my affections and, and my commitment, I decided, you know, real quickly that we were going to we were going to leave the Marine Corps. So I'm a I'm a planner. I'm organized and I like to plan. I don't just like to do something off the whim. I mean, you can ask my wife if she tells me on Friday night that Saturday we got plans. It drives me nuts cuz she didn't give me a week's notice. Um, so we sat down, my wife and I, and we said, so what do we want to do? And we knew after being apart for either training or deployments or whatever that we didn't want to be part, uh, apart anymore. So we put together a plan. Um, I went to, to the base school, like you said, and the way that the Marine Corps works is they don't give everybody the jobs that they want, right? Because they don't want to spread load all their top graduates in the best fields or whatever. So it's broken up into thirds. And the only way you guaranteed your job is if you take number one. So I'm this old, you know, staff sergeant, now a lieutenant in the basic school. The only way I can guarantee the job I want is i got to graduate number one against all these young young bucks. And that's exactly what I did. You know, we put a plan together, graduate number one, and take financial management. Well, the day that the colonel asked me what job I wanted, and I told him financial management, he almost fell out of his chair. He couldn't understand why this recon, ranger, airborne, top secret clearance marine would go from life of jumping out of planes to the life of sitting behind a desk. And yes, while that wasn't necessarily the type of marine I wanted to be, it wasn't the end state of where I was going. The end state was I was going to be a business owner with my wife and I wanted to learn the most about uh, financial management and, and, and stuff like that uh, to make me successful in the next realm. So I was setting myself up, which the Marine Corps did a fantastic job. You know, I worked on a couple of the presidential budgets. I worked with a whole bunch of uh, operating targets across the United States to make sure that the Marines got the funding they needed for great training and great gear. And by the time I left, we were really set up for uh, setting us up for success when we bought our Valpac franchise. As far as buying the, the, the franchise and how we came to that decision, uh, one of the reasons why I was so uh, enamored with my wife was just as much as I was uh, passionate about being a Marine, she was extremely passionate about Valpac. And I didn't get it. You know, I was like, this is a coupon company. How could you be so passionate about this? Well, long story short, you know, she grew up in this, in this coupon company. Her parents were one of the original franchise owners, and she saw how this product – um, helped grow businesses, uh, make other people successful, and the value that it brought to the community uh, as far as the savings. So, yes, I was I was bought in a little bit with what Robin's passion was, but I think what really um, tied me in and made my decision to really go forward with being first in business with my wife and second in the decision of owning a Valpac franchise was that I got to meet the, the franchisor, the, 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 the company, the individuals that ran the company, how they enact, uh, interacted with their franchisees, and I watched how they were able to make the product relevant because they were constantly innovating themselves and not just sticking with one product that they were good at for 40 years with the printed piece that's in the homes, but you know, with the, the, the internet and the digital and just all the other things that a really true marketing company should be able to provide our, our consumers, and that's when we made our jump. Makes sense. Totally makes sense. All right. <clears throat> well, here's here's what I'd like to do. Um, I would like to kind of gauge today's show um, and take you back a little bit. Um, I want you to think about the skill set that you developed uh, in the core, and I really want to relate those particular traits and skills um, to business and entrepreneurial skills uh, because. You know, many of our folks are trained in what they do, but they're not necessarily trained entrepreneurs. Uh, and I think a lot of the skills you developed, you have a very unique way of looking at things. So um, that's that's really the way I want to gauge this. So let, let's let's dig in. You know, <clears throat> I often hear you talk about the 70-30 rule. Uh, and I'm not sure that anybody else knows what that is. So what is it and, you know, why do you feel it's important for success? Um, it's, it's, it's so funny because every, you know, the things that I'm going to talk about today is, is, is so like common to me. And I, I know your viewers are, a lot of them probably don't have military background. So if I use a, a synonym or acronym on, on anything, uh, just let me know if you want me to expand on it. The 70 30 rule is, is really simple. It's, it's basically the ability to make a decision based off of 70% of the information provided, right? 
So in the Marine Corps, on the battlefield, if you had to wait for 100% of the information, by the time you made your decision, you'd be overrun or outflanked, right? And, and this is the same thing that our, our leaders do, our generals do, our president does. You know, a lot of the people out there are like, why would he make this decision? Well, he's got a lot more information than we have, but he's making the best decision with 70% of the information provided. Well, I try to use that same 70-30 rule in my business today, uh, especially because in business, everything is so fast-paced in, 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 our, in our society. So if you wait for 100% of the facts, by the time you make your decision, information is already going to be changed, right? So you have to be nimble. You have to be able to make quick, sound decisions. Now, this doesn't mean that I sit behind my desk and I wait for my sales reps or my employees to come in with what they think 70% of the good information is, right? I'm constantly researching my craft and improving it so when the opportunity arises and the, the question or the situation is presented to me, I can quick, quickly assess the situation and come up with a solid decision. That's the 70-30 rule, basically, down dirty. I love it. I love it. And that, that would actually... Um, I, the major challenge I see with, with many of our clients is, you know... They're so, so slow to pull the trigger on things because they're waiting for that other 30%. Absolutely. And, and if you wait too long, Jason, the situation has already changed. Of course. You know, every, every, percent, every percentage that you get above that 70, right? You know, you're now either, it's a potential problem. Okay, that, uh, that makes sense. You know, over beers, we've talked about the importance of integrity, both as a Marine as well as as an entrepreneur, you know. Why do you feel, because I, I've, I've certainly met with many people who don't feel that integrity is that big a deal. You know, business is business and integrity be damned. Why do you feel that it's that important? There's definitely a majority of the people out there that I would say think business is business. Uh, I, I live by some simple rules and I, I, I truly believe good things happen to good people, right? So my integrity, I think, goes way back to the way I was raised. Uh, my father was old school, hell, he, he's, he's still old school, and, and I look at him as, the way I looked at him as a kid, I still see him to this day, he's, he's John Wayne, right? He, he looks you in the eye, shakes your hand, and, and his word is his bond, it's better than any contract you're ever going to sign. That's how my father was when I was growing up, and that's how I still see him as today. And he taught me that a man's word is, is the most important thing that you could ever have, right? So. When I was younger, if I did something wrong or I lied, my father was tough on me, you know, got a spanking or whatever it was back then. But he, it was harder on me as far as he, he lost my trust, right? So, and he made me have to earn that trust back. And I realized at a very early age just how hard it is to re earn respect and to get a good name, but how quick you can lose it, right? Mm -hmm. So the older I got, the more it became important to me. And it was magnified once I joined the Marine Corps because their ethos are honor, courage, and commitment. It's, it's, it's what exemplifies a Marine, right? And it really hit home for me. And so I, I volunteer for the recon teams. And, and to be part of a reconnaissance team, I'm telling you, Jason, there's nobody better. Uh, and, and you'll have your Rangers and your Navy uh, SEALs. and they're all, they're, they're all great guys, right? But everyone's going to you know, say their unit's the best. But I'm telling you, I dealt with the best of the best. And when my brother would look me in the eye and say, I got this or I got you, I never questioned it because our word was our bond. And there's something very comforting in knowing when you're dealing with somebody in real life that they're going to do what they say they're going to do. And I, I brought that sense of uh, urgency, importance, those characteristic traits, I brought that to the business world. And let me tell you, it's hard. Uh, we deal with customers and clients and they all will tell you that they're going to do what they, what they say they're going to do but at the end of the day um, most don't but I'm not and, I, and my, my employees know this my wife knows this it's important for me at the end of the day to lay my head down on my pillow and know we did business the right way right so I, I, I brought the, those traits that I got from the Marine Corps to the business world because in business, your employees and your customers and consumers need to believe in you. They need to, to understand that, one, you're going to do what you say you're going to do, right? If I tell you that I'm going to mail you and, and put out 10,000 mailers uh, in a specific town, I'm going to do that. And it's not going to make a mistake and put it in the wrong town, right? Two, that you have their best interest in mind. All too often, 
businesses do what they think is best for their business and not for the person they're doing business with. The way that I look at it is, is our business owners are coming to us because they need a successful advertising campaign. And I need to make sure that I'm not selling them something that might be good for my business, but I'm selling them something that's going to work for their business. And, and finally, your, your, your business owners, your clients, your consumers, your employees, they got to trust you. And I know it sounds crazy in, in this time frame, but trust goes a long way. You know, without integrity, your employees won't believe in you. And they definitely won't work hard for you. Your clients are just going to look at you as a commodity. And your consumers won't even touch your product because there's simply no value there. Fabulous. And, you know, from, from a leadership perspective, you know, you were asking folks to do things that, you know, were dangerous and challenging and tough and scary and all those other things. Um, they had to, they had to trust you on that. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And the way you earn someone's trust is by, you know, leading from the front. You don't tell someone to go do something and, and watch while you're sipping on a cup of coffee. If, if without even having to say something, they see you getting up and doing it and leading from the front, the, the trust is going to be built. It's something you earn, right? You, you earn trust and you earn respect. It's not given to you. Ever, ever, ever. How do you feel that accountability plays into the success or failure of a business? Because I know that, obviously, you have to be accountable for yourself and your team. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> it's, you're making me miss my guys. Um, <laughs> you know, the, God, I miss them so much right now. Uh, accountability plays a huge role in our daily operations and the success and failure, I think, of every business. I'll use a Marine Corps term. It's called lateral limits, right? So we go to a rifle range, pistol range, shooting range, and you're giving your lateral limits immediately. And basically what your lateral limits are is your, your left side and your right side limits of where you're going to shoot. And the reason why they tell you, and they're, they're big signs or whatever, is because it's going to keep the range safe and everybody needs to know where their fields of fire needs to be. And I, I brought that back to my business because I think it's very important that everybody knows what their lateral limits are so that you can hold them accountable, right? And, and it, it starts from the top. So, you know, for us, for example, you know, I think any business has to, has three three areas where you need to hold people accountable. First, you have to hold yourself accountable, you have to hold your, your employees accountable, and you have to hold your clients accountable. So for us, you know, we came in and, and took over a business, and one of the first things we did is, is we discussed expectations, we documented them, and we ensured that both our employees and our customers understood why these procedures and policies were being put in place. But even, even beyond that, before we even met with our sales reps, you know, for the first meeting, my wife and I sat down and we discussed our expectations of each other. And, and I think that's, that's really important, especially if you're going to work with your wife or any partner. But, Hell yeah. Um, we, we, we sat down and we said, okay, what's your role? What, what's your responsibility? And what are you going to do? And, and like, what's your 50% weight that you're carrying? You know, what load are you carrying for our team? And then I sat down and said, okay, this is what I, I'm responsible for. And when someone fell short, uh, you know, we let each other know, like, hey, listen, this isn't my role. You're the, you're the, the office guy. You're the HR guy. You're the logistics guy. You know, and, and I would tell her, hey, you're the sales manager. You're, you're in charge of sales. And, and by clearly defining those roles, it, it's in very important in any partnership, even more so in a marriage, uh, it's enabled us to, one, have mutual respect for each other, and two, hold each other accountable. Um, as far as holding our clients accountable, prior to us taking over, uh, we got to remember, I bought this franchise in 2007, right? So that's right right about where I, I think I bought my house at the highest point, which it's no longer worth that value. And, and I took over a business that uh, I think their accounting and, and their collections was set up differently because it was a different period in, in our economy. But in 2007, the floor fell out, right? So in the first four months, Robin and I put $60,000 into collections. And you want to talk about someone that looks at his wife and said, man, I have five years left till I retire in wrinkle. What am I doing here, right? So I went to the drawing board and I said, listen, what's our, what's the value proposition from us and our clients? Why are we doing all this work and they're not paying us till two or three months down the road? Why are our reps working so hard and they're getting paid for October's mailing in December? It makes no sense. So we said, okay, how do we fix that? And we fixed it right off the bat with changing our collection policy. 
I mean, I don't know anybody that puts a roof on their house and pays somebody three months later for the roof, right? They're paying up front. So that's exactly what we did. And, and everyone thought we were crazy. You know, I have employees that have been with our family for over 20 years and even new people I, I, I hired. I said, listen, our collection policy is everything's paid in full before we, we final our mail. They, they thought we were nuts. But I will tell you this. Since 2008, I haven't used a collection agency. I haven't put anybody in collections. And 100% of our book of business is paid in full before we deadline, which has actually made it easier for us, which is what, what I was trying to do and protect my business. But it had two other things that, that actually protected us and made better. It made our client relations better because we weren't chasing our client after a mailing for a $300 check when he's worried about you know the pizza delivery or the cars being down. And, and, our, and our sales reps were, were happier because they weren't chasing that commission check. So at the end of the mailing, our clients aren't being bothered, our reps are being paid, and it's actually enhanced our relationships with our clients, and we didn't lose anybody by changing that collection policy. So we held our clients accountable. And then finally, we had to hold our employees accountable, right? So I came in, I'm looking at this board, and we're a sales company, and I'm looking at every month who's got a new sale or a new acquisition, and you had your superstars that had your four or five new, then you had your sales reps that had zero. One new, two new, zero new acquisitions. And I looked at my wife and I said, we own a sales company, right? And she's like, yeah. I said, well, how is the sales company going to survive if there's no new acquisitions? You know, it's, it's a numbers game, right? So eventually your, your sales are going to drop because you're not bringing in new. And I said, this isn't good either. So we sat down and I basically told our sales reps our, our lateral limits or what we expected them, what we would do to hold them accountable. You know, there's plenty of days in the week, there's plenty of days in the month, and we basically figured out what was the legit amount of new acquisitions an average sales rep uh, in our company should bring in. And by holding them accountable, uh, I can tell you that every single employee in my company brings in an average of five to eight new accounts every month, which is pretty high for our, our network. Um, and and they, every month they meet those requirements. And, and the key to anything, as far as holding somebody accountable, is you're holding yourself accountable but you don't waver, right? So if you give someone your expectations, you don't waver on it when they fall short. That's that right there. Folks could uh, folks could pack up and and call it a day just with that line. It's, <laughs> it's that it's that important. All right. You know when I think of the Marines, <clears throat> uh, in my head I've got the image of a well disciplined, well trained soldier, right? How do you feel, and what role do you feel like discipline plays in the entrepreneurial world? Ah, um, discipline, accountability, integrity—I mean, they all kind of go together. And I think when you can you can fine tune those skills, you could be extremely successful. But I, I think it's even more important to to define what is discipline. Right? Is discipline that you're going to go to work? every day at the same time do the same thing over and over again. Uh, I was told a long time ago uh, from a, a Marine I respect, I was a, I was a Lance Corporal, right? And, 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 you know, Lance Corporals are just trying to, trying to get through the day without taking too many orders from too many people because you're at the bottom of the barrel. And he said, you know, he asked me, what's discipline? And I, and I just said, I'll, I'll, you know, discipline, I'll, I'll do what you tell me I'm going to do. And he said, no, discipline is doing the right thing even when no one is looking. And it really, it hit home for me. And I tell my kids this all the time. Do the right thing even when I'm not around. Don't just do it when I'm watching. And and that's just another trait that we brought to our business. You know, I, I ask my reps, do we sell the right program to our clients or are we just order takers? If we're just order takers, what value are we bringing to our clients, right? In, in, in direct mail, it, there's so much competition. And yes, there's cheaper versions out there than Valpac. But I'll tell you that there's no one out there that's better than us, okay? They don't mail to as many homes. They can't track as, like we track. They, they, they don't pay attention to the detail and they're not as transparent as we are with our results, all right? Our, our, our reps are not gonna oversell somebody just because they have this amount of money in their budget and they're like, we need to spend it. Well, that's great, but are we going to spend it correctly? Are we going to do the right frequency, the right volume? Do you have a good offer on there? Um, so it's our job to make sure that we're consultants and we do the right program. That's hard in sales. 
right? You have to be disciplined because any sales rep would love to, to go into a client and they say they have $10,000 to, to spend and any sales rep would love to take that $10,000 right away for one quick sale and walk away. But at the end of the day, if it's not done correct, you're going to lose that client and that's not how you make money over, over the course of the long run. The way you make money over the course of the long run is by building relationships and having long-term clients. And that goes with my sellers making even more tougher decisions and more disciplined sales. We have clients, and, and Jason, I, we deal with on average 150, 200 clients a month. So over the course of the of a year, you know, we're dealing with a lot of clients locally. Mm -hmm. There are some great clients out there that are great in their craft, right? They're great roofers. They can make a great pizza. But it doesn't necessarily mean that they're great business people, right? So I had a fencing guy that he, he did it. We had a great mailing for him, and he made a lot of money. But the next month, he had no money to advertise because he spent all that money down in Atlantic City and blew it all away. There's mm -hmm. nothing we could do to help that type of business owner out, right? And then you have the business owners that don't want to pay, or they want to mail a pack one time. They don't want to do the recommended offers. They don't want to mail the right amount of volume. And we have all this research with, like, What's good for a pizza offer? What's good for a, uh, how many homes or what's the volume a roofer should do? And my reps know with the research that they have at their fingertips that if the sale's not a good sale, they need to walk away. And it's, it's discipline, right? It's, it's hard to walk away from someone that's holding a check and say, I want to mail with you one time. Why would we do that? It's simple because if you allow someone to do ballot pack incorrectly, it probably won't work. And then after one simple mailing, they're going to badmouth your company that you worked so hard to do a good job on. And, and that, that's, it's, like, it's like losing your, 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 your integrity, right? And you have to build that trust back up. It's, it's hard to get, but it's quick to lose. It's the same thing. It's hard to get a good client, but it's quick to lose, and it's quick for them to badmouth file pack. So if a sale's a bad sale, my reps need to be disciplined enough to walk away. Makes sense. Totally. Finally, finally, I think as a business... The most disciplined thing you have to do is you have to ask tough questions every day. Um, we sat down, and it, it's it's the you would think it's the simplest question: Who's our client? Who who's our client? And everyone looked at me like this guy's nuts. What's this Marine asking? We've been doing this for twenty years. What do you mean who's our client? Our client's the business owner. Well, you're right. It is the business owner. Who else? And that simple question, who else made them stop and think? Because they were just doing business a certain way, right? They were just going, knocking on doors, asking someone if they wanted advertising. Valpac's not just about the business owner at all. Valpac is a local media advertising company that pro provides valuable coupons and savings to our community. So who are we missing there? We're missing our community. We're missing our residents. It's great you're going to the business owners. You don't even realize that your clients are the people that open their mailbox or click on their app on their phone, and they're looking for value. So how do we reach out to those consumers, those customers, and find out what makes them happy? And, and I think when we just ask those tough questions, peel that on you, and sat down and realized, oh, wow, we have two people that we got to make happy every month, that's when we were able to start growing the business and make it better for everybody, the better the package, uh, the more the consumers are going to open it and see savings in it. The more consumers that open it, the more uh, leads and, and uh, customers that our business owners are going to get. And when those two clients are happy, that's when our franchise will be successful. You know, I'm, I'm thrilled you said that because so many of our, so many of my listeners <clears throat> are owners in the after-school activity world. So owners of martial arts schools, gymnastics uh, gyms, cheerleading gyms, dance studios. And for years, I've been saying, listen. You're only addressing one of your client. It's not just the one with the credit card. It's also the one in the uniform. Or it's 100%. not, it's not right. just the so, one in the uniform, right? So like, if you're not addressing that who else question, you know, think about that, folks. When you go back to your Monday morning meeting, you know, who is our client and follow up with that who else, you're going to see life-changing results. A hundred percent, Jason. Like, listen, you guys have an unbelievable program, right? And it's great that so many people are, are bringing value to uh, these parents and, and what their kids are learning. But if their kids weren't enjoying the program and getting something out of it and having fun, they, would, they wouldn't want to go, right? So you're smart enough to realize who your clients are, and you've hit it on the head. And that's what every business owner needs to do. It's the simplest question. Who's our client? So powerful. So, so powerful. 
So tell me this, you know, as a Marine, obviously, you know, the concept of LBE, and you can talk about that in a second, you know, made all the difference in the world. You know, first of all, explain to folks who don't know what that stands for is, and how can business owners implement it? LBE stands for Leadership by Example. All right, so I, I was very fortunate enough in the Marine Corps that everybody I ever served with, every, every Marine, just the best of the best. But in the business world, in the civilian sector, everyone likes to throw that around, but it, it, it means something different. And, and to me, when I watch it, it, it's crap. It pisses me off. It, to them, LBE is leadership by exemption, right? Do as I say, not as I do. Why, why are you not here early, but you, the, the owner's showing up in the afternoon? Well, because I have this and I have that. So does everybody else. So does your employees. Everybody, everybody's got stuff going on. Everybody's got garbage in their life that they're trying to take care of. But it's our responsibility as owners to lead by example and not by exemption. I try to be the first one in my office and the last one out. Doesn't necessarily mean that my day is more important and I got all this stuff that I'm, I'm doing, but one, I find when I'm the first one in the office, I, I can get stuff done before everybody comes in, but it's usually early in the morning or late in the afternoon that my rep comes to me with either a problem or just wants to download, you know, some of their frustrations and I'm here for them. Plus, when they walk through that door and they see that my light's on, they don't feel like it's them against the world. They, they're like, wow, he's here. And it just, it really sets the point home that we're going to be with them 100% of the way. I mean, my wife and I, we try to lead by example every single day this company is open. You know, there's nothing that my, my admin does or my sales reps do that my wife and I won't do. It, it, you know, simple things from cleaning the coffee pot, order entry, sales calls, or even answering the phone. We all do it, and nobody's more important than the next person in this office. You know, we, we, we try to work really hard and play hard to incorporate that with, with, with all of my employees. It's not just, you know, Rob and I going out and having fun. We take our employees with us. Um, I think if you leave from the front, and you do it with passion and conviction, and you do exactly what you say you're going to do, your people will follow you through the worst of times. And from 2007 to 2014, I have had uh, some very tough mailings, and my employees have had some very tough goes. But I've stuck with my employees, and my employees have stuck with me because they know that we'll get through it together. Fabulous. Fabulous. Here's, one, here's, here's a question for you that I think, um, I think is is going to be important for every single listener. Um, how's the development of a thick skin impacted your role as a CEO of your firm? <laughs> <laughs> I have been told that my skin is too thick and I'm not sensitive enough. But uh, <laughs> I, I will t I'll tell you this. Listen, the Marine Corps has, has, has helped me as a leader learn that you cannot lead the same way with every individual. Okay. Um, and, and for me, I'm very thick skinned. I can care less what anybody thinks about me. Um, I know at the end of the day, I did a good job and I did it honestly and loyally. Um, but I've had you tone back a little bit my, my leadership style because I am very uh, uh, rough around the edges, I would say. <laughs> um, but I, so you handle your reps differently, right? You can't handle one in the Marine Corps. You can't handle Johnny from Alabama the same way as you would handle Joey from New York City. They don't talk the same way. They don't act the same way. They won't respond the same way. It's the same thing with my reps. But but also, by the way that I – you have to be true to yourself, right? So I couldn't change too much because fundamentally the core of who I am is this. I'm always going to be a Marine, Jason. No matter what, when I'm 60 years old and, and my wife's husband comes to me, I'm still going to be a grumpy Marine. And so over the course of time – because I've been consistent with who I am, even my reps have changed. They, they get who I am, right? So if, if my reps screw up, I'm not the type of person, and a lot of people I think do this wrong in the, in the business community, they, they dwell on things, right? So a, a, an employee screws up and they kind of mumble under their breath about the employee and they bitch to their partner and then they go home and they dwell on it. I, it just, I can't work that way. So. My reps learned really quickly that they had to kind of get some thick skin because I was going to come at them right away when something was wrong. We were going to attack the situation. We were going to talk about it. How do we fix it? And then right from that moment, we move on. It, it's done. It's over. And, and it makes your business better when you don't dwell on things. You rectify the situation and you move on. I, lear I learned a long time ago, right? 
and, and it was from, I was trying to train my dog. And my, my wife wanted a dog, and, you know, everybody thinks it's great when you have a dog until you realize that, yep, you're the one taking care of it. But, you know, so my wife, God, God bless her, you know, wants to get this dog trained. I, who knows? So we're in Georgetown, and we're taking this dog to training lessons, and, you know, I t- tell the trainer, I'm like, I got home yesterday, and the dog had a mess in the house, and, like, what did you do? I said, well, I, you know, I brought the dog over to the pile, and I, I, I smacked the dog on a snoot. And she, the person was, like, totally screwed up. I said, what are you talking about? He said, did the dog, was the dog jumping when you got home? I said, yeah, it was happy to see me. He said, so the dog could have made that mess, you know, two hours ago. You're coming home. The dog's totally forgot about the mess. You're walking in. It's happy to see you, and the first thing you do is walk him over to a corner and smack him. You know, and it kind of resonated with me because I, I was punishing the dog for something that it did down the road or, or, or earlier, and, and he's totally forgotten about that. So simple as it may sound, I try to remember that when I come home with my kids because your kids are just happy to see you. And while they might have had a bad day at school, you have to kind of like cater to like, okay, let's go over the situation, but not, let's not run through the door and start yelling at them for something they did four hours ago. And I apply that to my business. When my reps or my employees or somebody screws up, we rectify that situation right then and there. And we work past it, and then we move on. If I bring it up something that happened a week ago and throw it in a sales rep's face or an employee's face, they look at me like, are you kidding me? That was a week ago. You're not over that? And, and, and by being able to touch mm-hmm. that situation right then and there and fix it immediately enhances my relationships with my employees, my kids, and definitely not mammals. because I got rid of the animal. <laughs> Smart, smart, smart. You know, it, we've discussed this in the past. In my past life, I had the honor of working with a ton of, of the military. And one thing every single one of them always talked about, especially while doing something that they found uncomfortable, was their ability to embrace the suck. Um, how do you feel like this can be used in the civilian world? You're, you're bringing back so, so many <laughs> sayings that just make me... Uh, I'm actually smiling on the other end. All right, so... It, it's funny. There, there's a term in the Marine Corps, and, and you'll hear it from anybody that's two months into a six-month deployment, and they're always going to say FTS or blank the suck, right? It, it's just Marines bitching. And uh, General Gray, who's my second all-time favorite Marine general, General Mattis is my all-time favorite. General Gray said a long time ago, show me a Marine that's not complaining, and I'll show you a Marine that's up to no good, right? <laughs> and, and that's it's so true, right? Marines at the, at the lower level, and I was one of them at, at some point in my career, was always bitching about what the staff sergeant said or what the gunny said or what the dumb lieutenant said because the lieutenant's the youngest guy here. He has no clue what's going on. And we were bitching because we didn't understand the larger picture. We didn't understand the larger picture. And the way the Marine Corps works, I'm not going to sit there and explain to a Lance Corporal what the larger picture is. But I always remember that. And I wanted to make sure that when I came to the business world that I didn't have my employees confused because they didn't know what was going on. Now, I'm not telling business owners that they have to share everything with their sales reps, right, or their employees, but I, you, have to, I, you have to explain them what the cause and effect is, right? So take the, 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 what I learned in the Marine Corps and then you bring it to the business world. Your sales reps do things all the time, and if they're not bitching and they're all happy, that means you're going to run your business into the ground because you're making decisions which are just good for your employees, and nine times out of ten, that doesn't equate to making decisions that are great for your business. They don't know the larger scale. So we have to worry about sales from as small as your local mom and pop pizzeria to sales that can span across the whole United States. And each one of those sales, for lack of better terminology, needs to be a, a good sale. It needs to make sense for our business. There's a lot of people that would want you to mail them for free or for a penny. And while that's great for those people, you're losing money. So we, we try not to make sales that we lose money, right? So when a sales rep is, is doing... Thing and we make a decision that you can see that they're not happy with. Um, while we understand that they're not going to be happy, we try to explain to them on a larger scale what that means to the business and what the cause and effect is. And when we do that, I think by sharing with them the cause and effect and what it means, they understand better. And when they can understand it better, they can see the bigger picture you know, on a larger scale. And by seeing that bigger picture... They might not dwell on, on, on what they were bitching about as long as they normally would, right? So I, I try not to hoard information. I try, I try not to be that person like information is power and it's like only Mike knows the information. Like I try to bring the rep in and say, hey, listen, 
this was a, a great sale, and I know you really wanted to get it, but you know we're really at a low price point here, and by the time we, you know, carry our fees and everything else, this is why your commission is where it's at, instead of just saying, it is what it is. It doesn't work that way anymore. And as long as you share with your reps the cause and effect, or your employees, I think uh, you'll hear a lot less bitching and a lot of le less of, uh, you know, enjoying the stuff or sucking it up. <laughs> awesome. Now, I know that you've been uh, doing a ton of work lately over the last couple of years to support our troops overseas. Do me a favor. Take a second. Um, what have you been up to? Um, I definitely couldn't have left the Marine Corps and just left it in the rearview mirror because it's, it's, it's part of the core fiber of who I am today. But I, I also couldn't, I couldn't become a reservist. I mean, some people can, and I don't knock the reservists, and I, I thank them uh, for everything they do. But coming from my line of work, I, I just I couldn't be a, a weekend warrior. Like I told you before, if I do something, I have to be 100% committed. So if I'm going to be a Marine, I'm going to be a Marine all the time, 24-7. But I had to still keep something uh, incorporated with what I'm doing next because the Marine Corps means so much to me. So I, I was lucky enough and fortunate enough, and, and, and part of this is, is thanks to Valpac. They're an unbelievable com company. Um, for a while, you know, Valpac reaches out to you know, stamp out hunger and stuff like that. Uh, they really wanted to help out uh, the military and Toys for Tots. And due to my connections where Valpac couldn't get in, I made one quick phone call to Quantico, and they were able to help out um, Toys for Tots. Every year they do an insert for Toys for Tots for October, November, December, which actually helps a lot of people. It helps the business owners because they're getting cheaper advertising with the Toys for Tots campaign on it, and it's helping Toys for Tots raise a lot of money uh, for, for children who are in need. But even more so, like, I just... I couldn't forget about the guys that I served with, the, the younger guys that I was their instructor on, and, and it started immediately in 2007. You know, our first holiday uh, season, we uh, we did uh, basically a, a holiday drive, and my reps would come in. I would leave thank you cards on our conference table, and it wasn't like something we did all together. Everyone did it on their own time, and our reps would write a thank you letter to any service member, right? And they would bring in socks or hand warmers or, you know, beef jerky. And in 2007, we sent out uh, care packages to uh, a unit where my friend was stationed overseas. And, uh, you know, the next year, a couple franchises found out about it, and it grew. And then uh, two years ago, it, it got so big that we needed corporate support. And we had over 10,000 armed force members uh, overseas get care packages from Valpac as a company um, during the holidays and it, it really it really was an amazing thing we actually had a uh, a flag raised in honor of Valpac uh, over a uh, marine base in Afghanistan uh, certified and it, it's, it's I'm really proud of what this company is doing for the military that's fabulous absolutely fabulous talk about giving back um, it is now time for our resource of the week so Mike, tell me this. You know, obviously, my listeners at this point have to be completely enveloped in this. And yeah, you know, how can they find out more about you, uh, more about Valpac? Um, you know, obviously, you're, you're more localized. So, um, how can they get a, how can they get a hold of you? All right. So for for me, I, I think you might have my my email or my or phone number on your on your site. You know, we're here locally in New Jersey. Uh, Robin and I are franchised. We own Essex Union in Hudson County. And if there's anybody out there in the local area, they could contact me via the, the email or phone number, and we could help them out. Uh, or better yet, you know, if they don't know where to reach out to, and they're in New Jersey or anywhere in the tri-state, if they reached out to us, I would put them in, in contact with the right person. Uh, the franchise network that we're part of is a very tight group. I know almost every owner out there, um, so I could put any business that, that's interested in Valpac in contact with the local franchise business owner, uh, and they would take care of them. And if you're just interested in, in general information about uh, Valpac in general or want to save money, um, you can go to iTunes and download the Valpac app uh, for your mobile phone. So wherever you go, where, you know, it could be from here to New York City, there's, there's local coupons on there. Or you can just go to Valpac.com and there's great savings on there from, from anything from spa treatment to getting uh, some money off on uh, replacing your roof. <laughs> Fabulous. So folks, just in case you're not um, streaming this off of the website, um, the phone number you can reach them at is 973-364-0100. Again, 973-364-0100. And to get in touch via email with Mike is uh, mjlozier, M-J-L-O-Z-I-E-R, at 
G S E Valpak, V A L P A K dot com. All right, obviously, this will also be on the show notes, so you can click through directly from there. You know, when I think about Valpak now versus what I remember growing up, um, obviously things are different. So, what would you say, to, or what would you share with somebody today, Mike, about um, what's different from Valpak or something that they probably don't know about? It's a fantastic question. I will tell you that everything is different. Uh, Valpak is not just the blue envelope that everyone is used to seeing in, in the mailbox once a month. And, and it's great that it is in the, in the mailbox once a month. That, that's our, our flagship product, and that's what's been driving results for 45-plus years, right? But like I told you in the beginning of, of the podcast, I, I, I joined in on Valpak because I believed in their vision and where we're going. Uh, they've done a great job in evolving. So we have the, the, the printed pieces that are in your mailbox. We have the mobile app that's been downloaded over 800,000 times. We have Valpac.com. We build websites. We build landing pages. We are now a Google certified partner and can sell Google AdWords. Uh, we can do proxy sites so that we can track uh, traffic for the people that are being driven to the, your website from your printed piece we have call tracking that we can monitor how many calls you get a week, and our reps will even analyze that traffic and tell you how many uh, takeout orders you have and what the final bill is on your takeout orders. I mean, where Valpac is today, I will tell you, not only because I, I own a franchise, but I truly believe this. There's a lot of people spending money on advertising, and they can't figure out their ROI on advertising. And Valpac, to me, is the most transparent advertising you can get today. Well, and for folks who have listened to me, um, if you can't measure it, you shouldn't do it. So that is uh, that is fabulous. All right, Mike, as you know, I, I always love to end my podcast with one important question. So if you could give business owners just one solid piece of advice to either help their business or even more importantly, help them to live a more balanced, better life, what would that piece of advice be? All right, I'll give you two because, like I said, I'm always intense. And then my wife will say, y you don't listen to anything I tell you. So I'll give you mine, and then I'll follow up with what my <laughs> wife does because she keeps it simple. She probably got this from her mother, um, and it's, if I follow her advice, I'll probably live long. So f first and foremost, obviously, you know, knowledge is key in anything you do, but I'll put it in another way. In order to be successful, you need to make yourself uncomfortable at least once a day. All right? So if you're not, and you're not pushing the envelope, no pun intended, okay? <laughs> but the... Uh, you're doing what's safe and what you're used to. And if you're doing what you're safe and what you're used to, you're never going to get to the next level. You're never going to be more successful than what you are today. So think of it as like pond water, right? Pond water sitting around, not moving, gets stagnant. All right? It's the, it's the simplest way I can, I, can, I can make my point. But if that same water is, is, is moving over rocks, right, it, the water starts to clear up. And the faster the water moves the more force that that water gets. And over a period of time, that water could actually cut through the rocks if you think of the Grand Canyon, right? Mm -hmm. So as an employer, I want my individuals not to be afraid to make a mistake. Now, I don't want individuals that are going to work for me that make mistakes all day long and never learn from them, but I want my reps to be a little bit uncomfortable, push the envelope, and make mistakes because when they do, that means they're trying to be more successful. Um, and, and that's really important for me. And, and, and I, every day I try to do one thing that makes me uncomfortable. I would tell you right now, I'm as uncomfortable as it gets talking to you in my, my computer, right? <laughs> um, and, and lastly, and probably more important, is to have fun in what you're doing. And I've learned this through from my wife, right? You know, guys are just wired differently. But if I drove down to Virginia and I made it in three hours and 59 minutes, God knows the next time I was going to drive down to Virginia, I was going to make it in three hours and 55 minutes. And I would tell my wife to go to the bathroom before she gets in the car because we could beat this. And she would look at me and she'd be like, why don't you just enjoy the drive? You know, enjoy the drive. And it, it, she made sense. I was so uptight. I was so tense. And I, I didn't enjoy the drive. And I was telling the kids to turn down their iPads. And now we'll get there when we get there. So my wife is right. Have fun in what you're doing. And if you're not having fun, you're doing the wrong thing. Life is too short. You know, Jason, at 30, you think you got, you know, 100 years left. And then 40, you find out that a buddy of yours is sick or someone else died of cancer. And, and the reality of, the, of the, the lifespan of people gets really, you know, it hits home. And you're like, wow, I'm missing things that are important. So at the end of the day, if you're not having fun, figure out what's going to make you happy and do it. 
Those are some strong words. I love it. Mike, thank you so much for taking your time today. I know how crazy your schedule is, so uh, it means the world to me that you'd uh, share some of your time, some of your experience, and some of your uh, your wisdom with us. I appreciate you having me. The pleasure was all mine. All right, folks, that is all the time we've got today. Thank you so much for tuning into The Real Deal with Jason Silverman. For more info about private coaching or to see if you'd benefit from one of our mastermind groups, visit me over at www.jasonmsilverman.com. I look forward to helping you achieve the success that you deserve. Until next time, let me leave you with this. Get out there and be the real deal. Set a goal. Make a plan. Work like hell towards it and achieve the success that you truly deserve. Now's the time. Get out there and make it happen. Go get them, folks. This has been Jason Silverman, and I hope you have a spectacular week. You've been listening to The Real Deal with Jason Silverman. To access the great resources mentioned in the show and for information on coaching and mastermind group opportunities with Jason, please visit JasonMSilverman.com.